Hello. Um, I was delighted to be invited to give this talk. Um, my only one regret is that I can't be down in the burn because it's one of my very favorite parts of the country. Um, but anyway, here I am um, on online. Um, I grew up uh, on a farm in County Wicklow, where I still live. Uh, my situation was a bit unusual in terms of our local area because both my parents were academics um, rather than full-time farmers. Uh, they'd met in Chicago in the 1930s when they were teaching at the university there. My mother was uh, an American from the Midwest, but my father was Irish. Uh, he'd grown up in Dublin, but through visits to distant relatives down in Tipperary, uh, he developed a passion for farming. As a result, he and my mother bought a farm uh, near uh, Chicago, and when they decided to move the family base to Ireland in 1952, that farm was sold, and they acquired instead the 127 acres uh, in Balnaclash, County Wicklow, uh, where I still live, where I've lived for most of my life now. Uh, this is a picture of me, aged nine, uh, with my parents standing behind me. Uh, it's me driving the Assen cart uh, in the farmyard in Balnaclash. My father was not only a farming enthusiast, uh, but he had very definite views about how you should farm. Uh, he felt far too much money in the 1950s was being invested in machinery that small farmers did not really need. Uh, he believed in what in India I think would be called intermediate technology, making use of the lower tech machines uh, that were available and power that was still readily available at the time. So in the 1950s, he had only horses to work the land, no tractor. Quite retro or future looking if you look at it in a different way. Um, there he is anyway, uh, sitting up on the disc harrow, uh, powered by, by, by two horses. The result of this was that I was raised on a farm which even by the standards of the day was very hands-on. Uh, we milked by hand uh, before we had a machine, that's me coming with a bucket of milk from, from the cow house immediately behind. Um, we mucked out calf houses and stables with fork and brush. Uh, dung was carted to the fields by horse and cart. The sheaves of barley and oats uh, uh, had to be stooped before they were stacked, uh, then hauled down into the hay shed where they awaited the arrival of the thrashing machine. Uh, that's the thrashing machine as I, as I, as I remember it. Um, there was always a very big day in the, in the farming year when up to 20 men were needed for all the work from the pitching down out of the hay shed, uh, then up to the machine, cutting the, the ties before they were fed into the thrasher, uh, building the uh, sta stack, uh, taking, taking the stacks of grain away, the sacks of grain away. That's what my father is doing on the left of the picture. Um, spreading the loose gain out of grain out on the loft. I'm actually sitting in the study, which used to be the loft where the grain was, was stored. Uh, and building the, the, the rick of straw at, at, at the far end. This is what Seamus Heaney called an age, the age of bare hands and cast iron. The lines are the opening of a poem called the Turnip Snedder, which was inspired by a period photo of a young man uh, in front of such a, 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 a turnip snedder or pulper as we would have called it. If you can zoom in closely enough on that image, you can see it's made by Philip Pierce and Company of Wexford, still a major uh, factory in, in my young day. I followed in my parents' footsteps insofar as I too became a part-time farmer as a sideline for my main occupation as a university teacher. And because of that personal farming background, uh, I came to be interested in the way farming is represented in Irish literature. When I started thinking about it, a remarkable range of Irish writers in the 20th and on into the 20th first century have built the life of the farm into their work. Some of them, of course, grew up on farms, uh, very notably Patrick uh, Kavanagh and Seamus Heaney. Um, 
Others were one generation away from farming, but near enough to be very aware of the background. So for example, John McGahern's father was a guard, his mother was a national school teacher, but both of them came from farms and the young McGahern spent his earliest years with his mother uh, on a small farm in, in Leitrim. He's unusual among major Irish writers, I think, in, insofar as he also went back to farming himself. Whether they came directly from farming or a bit removed from it, as they developed into writers, they tended to move away into the city, to the city. So much of the representation of farming is retrospective, looking back to the memories of their parents or sometimes grandparents. And that's why I've called this talk Back on the Farm, the writers looking back over their shoulders, so to speak. It's also the reason why a great deal of the remembered farm scenes in Irish literature are set in earlier periods, the 1950s or before. In many cases, what is recalled is the small family farm typical of the West Coast and North Midlands, where all the work was done by members of the family, including children. And this is another feature that differentiates uh, these earlier periods from the present. When so much of farm work was manual, children from a relatively young age could be actively involved. I remember being given the job of raking away the chaff from under the thrashing machine. Goodness knows how vital that was to the, the whole process, but I thought of myself as no end of a man in doing it. Uh, I would harrow uh, uh, with the seed drill with my little pony, and I felt I was actually contributing uh, to the process of sowing. And in that case, I think it was. By now, you can't do much on a farm until you can drive a tractor, which goodness knows many kids do young enough, younger than they should. Uh, still, there's not that same level of contact with soil and with animals that you had in earlier times. And it's this intimacy with the land and the farm, uh, the farm labor, that figures, I think, in so many Irish writers in which I felt I recognized and related to when I read their work. And that's how I came to write this uh, book that Pranjali mentioned, um, Farming in Modern Irish Literature. A number of things especially fascinated me about the Irish literature of farming. One was the way in which the uh, people from rural backgrounds found the means to become writers and get themselves published. Men and women who often came from very poor families with many children and little access to education, how did they get to the position where they were able to write? Then there were all those childhood memories, uh, reviewing a book on the subject, someone rise quack, wise crack that, quote, no Irish childhood goes unpublished. And I have to confess that I published a childhood memoir myself called Nothing Quite Like It. But the memories of childhood on the farm come in very different forms, romantic, nostalgic recollections of an idyllic time, or horror stories of what went on within the tightly closed community of the family farmhouse and neighborhood. It certainly wasn't all sunlit uplands. Ireland has changed enormously over my lifetime, and perhaps rural Ireland most of all as we've gone from being a predominantly agricultural country to one which is heavily ur urbanized and suburbanized. How have Irish writers reacted to these changes and to the vanishing farming lives they remembered? So these are gonna be the three subjects uh, for my talk this evening. The first one from farming to writing, where I look at how people became writers from farming backgrounds. The second one, childhood memories. And finally, farming and modernization. So I'm going to begin with uh, from farming to writing. One of the things I found most exciting about researching this book was reading writers that I'd never read before and learning something about their lives. Patrick McGill was a case in point. Um, born on a, a small farm uh, in, um, in uh, County Donegal, his early life would have been um, 
typical in the very poor parts of, of that, that part, part of the world. In families that couldn't afford um, uh, more than, uh, uh, couldn't afford their many children to support their many children, the oldest would have been sent out um, as hired laborers uh, to the Lagan, those parts of East Donegal, uh, Derry and, and Tyrone, where seasonal workers uh, were needed in the summer. In their later teens, they would have taken to um, Tatey Hoking, uh, picking potatoes in Scotland, often in terrible conditions. Where McGill's life diverged uh, from that of his contemporaries was when he started to publish verse about his life as the navvy poet at the age of 20. From there, he moved to London, working as a journalist, and was taken up by the royal, for, former royal chaplain, Sir John Neil Dalton. And that is how his first novel, Children of the Dead End, uh, passionately graphic exposure of the exploitation of workers like himself appeared in 1914 with a preface dated from, wait for it, the Garden House Windsor, part of Windsor Great Park. There was another route up into a writing career, as you can see from the case of Padder O'Donnell, an almost exact contemporary uh, of uh, McGill from just a little further north in Donegal. He grew up in the Rosses, one of the very poorest areas in Ireland, the youngest of nine children. However, he didn't leave school at 10, like McGill, but stayed on to become a student monitor, a pupil teacher. After four years in that capacity, he was able to win a King's Scholarship that took him to teacher training in St. Patrick's College, Drumcondra, before coming back to teach uh, in the Rosses. He was influenced by the condition of Irish seasonal workers in Scotland to join the labor movement, becoming an organizer for the ITGWU. He served in the IRA and fought on the Republican side in the Civil War, spending two years in prison as a consequence. It has to be said that his life was made a good bit easier by his marriage to Lyle O'Donnell, no relation, she spelt differently, a wealthy common man uh, activist who shared his political beliefs. Though many of his novels are very politically motivated in Islanders, which I think is a wonderful novel, uh, he represents very movingly the life of the island community of Aaron Moore off uh, Burton Port. Um, and in his last novel, The Big Windows, he takes us inside the tightly knit farming community of the Donegal Mountains. In writing about farming, I've cast my net fairly widely and included, for instance, the Blasket Island autobiographers who did plant potatoes but lived off fishing, hunting rabbits, seals and puffins, collecting flotsam and jetsam from shipwrecks on the, on the shore. Uh, the, the First World War was a great period in the Blaskets. Um, uh, um, uh, because there were so, so many wrecks. Uh, Thomas O'Crehan uh, lived all his life on the Great Blasket Island. He got what education he could uh, from uh, uh, the national school and the island when intermittently a teacher could be found to uh, teach there. However, as the national uh, schools of the time taught only through English, uh, he was not literate in Irish until uh, his middle age uh, when he taught himself uh, to read and write in Irish. It was visitors to the island who themselves came to learn Ireland, Irish who encouraged him to write and especially uh, to, uh, to write the text of On Talonach, which becomes one of the great classics of modern Irish. The book came to international attention through the translation uh, by the Englishman Robin Flower. This is the pattern also with the other Blasket autobiographers uh, that followed uh, Morris of Sullivan with uh, uh, Fitter and Peg Bloss, 20 years of growing, and uh, Peg Sayers' uh, Peg. 
They were not professional writers, but were helped towards publication by others who enabled readers to get the inside story of what it was like to live in the harsh conditions of the Blasket Islands through the early years of the 20th century. There was a positive vogue in the 1930s for such insider accounts of rural life, and that was what encouraged a British publisher to bring out Patrick Kavanagh's early memoir, The Green Fool, in 1938. I always like to use this uh, particular picture of uh, Patrick Kavanagh, uh, rather than the more familiar, older, uh, craggier one, uh, because it was taken just across the valley from where I live in Wicklow. And if you squint very hard at that, you can see in the very left-hand corner behind Ka Kavanagh, uh, is my house. So, um, Patrick Kavanagh's father was a cobbler and shoemaker in Inishtgeen, uh, County Monaghan, uh, who did well enough in his trade as a cobbler to build a house for his nine children, and by degrees uh, to buy a total of 25 acres, uh, moving him up to the superior status of small farmer. Patrick was the fourth child and for many years the only son of the family who was expected to inherit the farm. He left school uh, at 13, common enough at the time, and was apprenticed to his father. Unfortunately, he didn't show much talent for cobbling, nor yet for farming. Uh, his father once complained, you broke every tool about the place except the crowbar, and you bent that. Patrick from early on really only cared about poetry. Any poetry he could get his hands on, uh, school textbooks, old almanacs, eventually the Victorian anthology, Paul Graves, A Golden Treasury. He published a few poems of his own, including the comic Address to an Old Wooden Gate that stands first in his collected poems, but he knew nothing of contemporary literature. There's a touching chapter in The Green Fool called The Grey Dawn, which was for Kavanagh the dawn of literary consciousness. He describes there a trip from Inishkeen to Dundalk to sell grass seed. Uh, he wanders into a newsagent's uh, uh, and finds a copy of the magazine The Irish Statesman. Reading it, he learns for the first time the names of James Joyce and Gertrude Stein, the great modernist writers of the 1920s. The Irish Statesman was edited by the veteran writer George Russell, who published under the pen name A.E. And it was E.A. who gave Kavanagh his breakthrough with the publication in the Irish Statesman of Plowman. I turn the lay green down gaily now and paint the meadow brown with my plow. I dream with silvery gull and brazen crow, a thing that is beautiful that I may know. Tranquility walks with me and no care. Oh, the quiet ecstasy like a prayer. I find a star lovely art in a dark sod. Joy that is timeless. Oh, heart that knows God. In The Green Fool, he supplies a context for this poem. Having bought a new farm in the townland of Shanko Duff, the family needs to acquire a horse. Paddy goes and buys a horse at auction only to discover that she's notorious for kicking, which makes it more difficult to find another farmer as joinsman. He explains in the book, every pair of one horse farmers joined forces at the start of the plowing season where a two horse team was needed. But it was when plowing on his own that plowman is composed. And he comments in the green fool, he says, I couldn't help smiling when I thought of the origin of my plowman ecstasy, a kicking mare in a rusty old plow, tilling a rood of land for turnips. The problem for Kavanagh was to find a means to include in his poetry, both the sense of spiritual intensity he got from the relationship with the land and the real life details of the farming life. It took him a long time to achieve that combination and he could only do it most successfully when he'd actually left Inishkeen and the farm behind. I want to give you just one example, uh, the poem 
car's ass or cur's ass. We always pronounce it car as in cars, uh, cars pinks, the potatoes. We borrowed the loan of car's big ass to go to Dundalk with butter, brought him home the evening before the market, an exile that night in Mucker. Mucker was Kavanagh's own um, uh, townland. We heeled up the cart before the door, we took the harness inside, the straw stuffed straddle, the broken britchen with bits of bull wire tied, the winkers that had no choke band, the collar and the reins. In Ealing Broadway, London town, I name their several names until a light world comes to life, mourning the silent bog and the god of imagination waking in a mucker fog. In the poem, we get the full actuality. The family still so poor that they have to borrow the loan of an ass and cart to transport their butter to market, the patched and broken harness, the very unpoetic townland name of mucker. Yet from the distance of London in retrospect, this journey is turned into a poem and a whole imaginative world comes to life. I'm going to turn on now to uh, childhood memories. What was it like growing up on a farm? Uh, some people are going to remember it nostalgically as a period of perfect happiness, surrounded by nature, nurtured by loving parents, living at one with an integrated community. The best known such account is Alice Taylor's uh, To School Through the Fields. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, though, there is the horrifying short story, uh, The Parting Gift, in Claire Keegan's uh, collection, Walk the Blue Fields. It opens as if it was going to be another ev evocative pastoral scene, a scene as Alice Taylor might have remembered it. The scent dr uh, uh, drifts up uh, of, from neighboring fields, as soon as the dew burns it off, the Rudd brothers will be out in the meadows, turning the rows, saving it while the weather lasts. With pitchforks, they'll gather what the baler leaves behind. Mrs. Rudd will bring out the flask, the salad. They'll lean against the bales and eat their fill. Laughter will carry up the avenue, clear like bird call over water. But what follows are the traumatized memories of the young woman who's leaving home, haunted by the horrors of having been repeatedly abused by her father when a child. That too was rural Ireland back then. It doesn't have to be one thing or the other, a dream or a nightmare. The tendency towards nostalgic memory can be offset by an ironic awareness that it wasn't always as one remembers it. And that's what I love about Jane Clark's poem, Dusk. I don't have to put up an image of Jane because she's going to be reading some of her poems uh, immediately I'm finished. Um, what I will say is that she's one of the contemporary poets that I most admire. And if you don't already own copies of her collections, The River and When the Tree Falls, you should get them as soon as possible. Uh, Dusk starts with recollections of farm work farm work as if addressed to a, sim, a, a sibling. Do you remember the bell across the river telling us it's time to walk with stacks of oats, sacks of oats to wooden troughs in the hill field, heave forkfuls over the dung heap wall, scatter straw for bedding, feed weanlings from buckets, stand guard over sucklers to stop them pucking fostered calves. Do you remember the voice calling hop, hop, hop to the slow chain of black and white cows, spurts of milk strained warm into wide blue rimmed basins? The poem becomes lyrically uh, atmospheric as it moves towards uh, milking time and the dusk of the title in these two lines, the lines that I've just quoted. But then the last couplet does something quite unexpected. Do you remember the voice calling hop, hop, hop 
to the slow chain of black and white cows, spurts of milk strained warm into wide blue rimmed basins. Do you remember the scent of wood smoke, lights coming on in the house? How we longed for the morning, we'd shut the gate and walk away. Children's life on the farm, reimagined in memory, produces a backwash of emotion, countered by another reality of the past, the sense of entrapment and the need for escape. What in a distant adult present is lovingly remembered as the habitual rhythm of the everyday, back then was a dragging repetition from which adulthood would at last bring release. I'm always anxious reading and interpreting poems in the presence of the author. Uh, what if Jane is sitting there thinking, no, he's getting it all wrong. Still, I'm going to risk uh, one more poem uh, of Jane's called Rhode Island Reds because it renders so effectively the shock children may feel at the necessary brutality, even violence, that is part of the farming life. The opening stanzas uh, picture the hens, the Rhode Island Reds, as they scratch around the farmyard. With flamenco flounces, they settle in dried up puddles, flick dust through their wings, how I remember them. And then suddenly there is this instead. I remember the first time I saw my mother choose one and with deft wrist wring its neck. That night, she plumped my pillows, smoothed my sheets, stroked the hair from my brow. There seems some shocking incompatibility in the tenderness of the loving mother with that ruthless capacity to dispatch the hens parading round the farmyard. It's one of the paradoxes of farming. The good shepherd cares for his sheep so that at the end of the day, he can butcher them. Seamus Heaney's first book, Death of a Naturalist, is all about coming to terms with the realities of rural life, which are so often fearful, brutal, anything but blissfully reassuring. His poem, The Early Purges, takes him from horror, I was six when I first saw kittens drown, to the hardened acceptance, now, when shrill pups are prodded to drown, I just shrug bloody pups. Of course, in the very title, The Early Purges, there is an ironic protest against this sort of cynicism. I want though to end this section on childhood memories with another poem of Heaney's from that collection, because I think it so tellingly renders the role reversals that come in the child as he matures into adult. The poem is Follower, which I'm sure many of you know. My father worked with a horse plow, his shoulders globed like a full sail, strung between the shafts and the furrow. The horses strained at his clicking tongue, an expert. He would set the wing and fit the bright steel pointed sock. The sod rolled over without breaking at the head rig. With a single pluck of reins, the sweating team turned round and back into the land. The skeptical reaction among um, locals in uh, Heaney's own uh, neighborhood uh, to the first line, my father worked with a horse plow, was not a hell of a lot. Um, Patrick Heaney was primarily a, a, a cattle dealer, uh, not a plowman, and by local standards, he wouldn't have been considered an expert at all. But that wouldn't have mattered to the young Seamus, for whom his father was a hero. For the young boy stumbling in the furrow behind him, uh, the impression of the man's effortless skill and strength in tune at once with the horses and the land that he's working makes him the role model his son longs to imitate. I wanted to grow up and plow, to close one eye, stiffen my arm. Yet in the final stanza, the roles have been reversed. I was a nuisance, tripping, falling, yapping always. But today, it is my father who keeps stumbling behind me and will not go away. 
When I read the poem first, I, I took it that the father had died and it was his ghost that kept stumbling behind the poet. But in fact, Heaney's uh, father didn't die until many years after this poem was first published. What I think the poem actually dramatizes is the difficulty one has dealing with the former hero worship of your parents when you yourself are a grown up. For Heaney, and I think for other writers from a farming background, this has to do with a, a fundamental shift of perspective. As a child in a rural context, your model of achievement was the hardworking, skillful farmer. As a writer, looking back at that time, how do you deal with that X role model? If you're Heaney, remembering your father digging, famous poem, you resolve to dig with the pen instead. At the start of this century, Ireland was no longer primarily an agricultural country. Less than 5% of the population now work on the land. On the list of our exports, as I looked at recently, agricultural products come in number 10, way down from pharmaceutical product, goods and the like. You might expect, therefore, in the 21st century that farming would no longer be a major subject for Irish writers, but such is not the case. Think of John Connell's The Cow Book. The distinctive feature of the book was its history of man's relationship with the cow through the ages, ending with a protest against factory farming and its effect uh, on the way cattle are treated. But it is also, as its subtitle suggests, a story of life on an Irish family farm. It's written as a journal of Connell's work over one winter on his father's farm in Longford. It reflects uh, its modern period in that he checks the lamb's symptoms on Google to diagnose what's wrong. And from time to time, he rings up his girlfriend in Australia. But the tensions between father and son over the management of the farm work are absolutely traditional, reproduce the tensions in any number of texts going back for a hundred years before. Or look at Anne Enright's The Green Road. Uh, I've known Anne since she was a student in Trinity, and I've always thought of her as an entirely urban writer. I had no idea that her father came from a farm in County Clare, or that she regularly spent holidays there. Uh, the setting we see in the opening chapter when the 12 year old Hannah goes out to visit her grandmother will be entirely familiar to everyone from the borough. Her father smelt of the day's work fresh air, diesel, hay, with the memory of cattle in there somewhere, and beyond that again, the memory of milk. He took his dinner, that is the father, out in Boulevon, where his mother still lived. Hannah loved the little house at Boulevon, four rooms, a porch full of geraniums, a mountain out the back, and out the front, a sky full of weather. That was in 1980, at the start of the novel. We fast forward through the novel to 2005, and the difference in times is registered when Hannah and her brother go for a drink in their local. Quote, a pub that in their youth smelt of wet wool and old men was now a gallery of scents, like walking through the perfume department in the duty free. The older rural Ireland survives even in the hypermodern world of the Celtic Tiger. We see this in Belinda McKeown's first novel, Solace. This is set at the very height of Ireland's prosperity in the years before 2008. The two central characters, uh, Mark and Joanne, are based in Dublin. Uh, he's struggling with a PhD at Trinity. Uh, she is a trainee solicitor. They meet at a party in Booterstown where cocaine is freely available. But both come from the same locality in Longford and Mark goes home at weekends to help his father on the farm. He's an only son. The problem here is one of incompatible viewpoints. Tom, the father, expects Mark sooner or later to return and take over running the place. The clash is dramatized by a parallel case, uh, a neighbor's son, Brian McCabe, 
who works for Google. Mark spells out the details of McCabe's expensive lifestyle as a highly paid software engineer with Google. How would a life like that be compatible with running a farm like Charlie's, demands Mark. How would he do both at once? Spend every weekend uh, up to his oxters and cow shit, is that it? Tom doesn't see the problem. Quote, a man could easily be living down here and doing whatever he wanted to with the time he wasn't at work. For Tom, working for Google be just the means to a bit of off-farm income. In the year 2000, John McGahern uh, published an angry newspaper article called Rural Ireland's Passing. Uh, I love this picture, I hope you can see it. Uh, in, on my screen, um, the sort of small images of the people watching uh, are, are obscuring the, 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 the image of, of John. I hope they're not in, in, in yours. Um, I love this picture of him in the, in, in the kitchen beside the, the aga with, with, the, with the cat on his lap. In, in that, uh, that, uh, that article he published, he enumerates the ecological disasters flowing from, quote, the gross and short-sighted mismanagement of state bodies pursuing agricultural modernization. On the polluted lake, he says, a green scum decorates the shore. The fish are dead. People in the water scheme have to boil their drinking water before use. This is but a microcosm of large parts of the country. However, in his last published novel, That They May Face the Rising Sun, there is none of this sort of polemic. Instead, he creates a lyrical picture of life beside the lake, very much modeled on the life he and his wife Madeline led in Foxfield County Leitrim, where they settled in the 1970s. Mutual support and shared work on the farm are the norm between the Rutledges, who are the counterparts of the real life McGaherns, and their good friends, Jamesy and Mary, as they move through the seasons from lambing, through haymaking, taking the lambs to the abattoir, selling the cattle in the winter mart. The novel, novel, however, is no idyllic picture of country life back then. There's the neighbor who preys on and abuses women, uh, the appallingly exploited orphan farm boy, the IRA leader who assisted in the Enniskillen bombing and yet is treated as a pillar of the community back home. But it does beautifully conjure up an image of the pre-modern rural Ireland. Late in the book, we see modernity at last come to the area in the form recognizable everywhere in the world. They stop at the corner of the lake. They stop the car in amazement. A telephone pole had been set down in the middle of the wild cherries and a line of poles stretched all the way out towards the main road. Some months previously, the telephone company had offered to connect each house in the country for the same fee, no matter how remote it was, and nearly everybody around the lake had agreed to the offer. After all the talk and final agreement, it was still a shock to see the substantial creosoted poles in place. The raw new telephone pole in the midst of the wild cherries is the symbol of an era coming to an end. Many Irish writers look back to life on the farm with a sense of the loss brought about by modernization. That intimacy with the land, that time of bare hands and cast iron and Heaney's phrase made for a sort of connectedness that's missing in the era of sil silage harvesters and robo milking. No one's likely to forget the sheer laboriousness of the earlier period, or indeed some of the terrible human abuses that went on within older rural communities. But nonetheless, it's felt that something irreplaceable, irreplace, ir, sorry, something irreplaceable has gone. I want to end with Epilogue, a poem by John Montague, that seems to me to sum up this feeling very poignantly. This was the last poem in Montague's collection, The Rough Field, in which he mapped out his own home territory of Garvahi in County Tervon, 
uh, through all its different historical periods. The rough field is the literal English translation of the Irish words that make up the, word, the, the name Garfahi. Driving through, south through Cavan and Monaghan, he reflects on the coming of modernity. A changing rural pattern means clack of tractor for horse, sentinel shape of silo, hum of milking machine, the same from Ulster to Ukraine. He acknowledges all that was wrong with the old ways. Only a sentimentalist, he said, would wish to see such degradation again. Yet something mourns, the iron ribbed lamp flitting through the yard at dark, the hissing froth and fodder scented warmth of a wood stalled fire or leather thong of flail curling in a barn were part of a world where action had been wrung through painstaking years to ritual. What he mourns, he says, is our finally lost dreams of man at home in a rural setting. This is the last stanza. Harsh landscape that haunts me, well and stone, in the bleak moors of dream with all my circling, a failure to return to what is already going, going, gone. A melancholy note on which to end, but perhaps in the question and answer session or when Jane is reading her poetry, we'll get into more upbeat mood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, that was absolutely beautiful and uh, really fascinating. Um, so. Thank you so much for that. I, I think um, I really liked how you ended on this thing about the, the intimacy of the relationship um, between, I guess, you know, in the past, especially between people and the land and communities, people within the community. And I guess that's 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 obviously changed. Um, a lot of people say when farmers set foot on the tractor, they lost some level of connection with the land. Um, we, we, we have a local poet and, and writer here, John O'Donoghue, who passed away a number of years ago, and he spoke a lot and wrote a lot about the sort of the, that intimacy that there's, it's, it's, it's obviously being, being eroded and shaped. And sometimes you wonder, um, when people write about this period in Irish farming, um, how will that be reflected uh, and, and how will that story be told? So it's, it's really thought-provoking, uh, Nicholas. Thank you so much. And rather than waste time with my words, I'd love to hear a little bit from Jane if, she's, if she'd like to, to, to regale us with a poem or two of hers. Jane, I'll, I'll pass across to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brandon. Um, I, I just also wanted to say that I love Nicholas's uh, presentation and I thought it was it told us so much about the different writers, but it was it was also so moving. And for me, the line, you know, the Kavanaugh line, the god of imagination waking in a mucker bog. I, I felt that said so much about all of what uh, Nicholas was talking about. So that was that was beautiful. So, yeah, I was going to ask Nicholas some questions, but I'll just read three poems first. And, and I know there'll probably be questions in the chat. Um, so just choosing poems to read. I stayed away from the ones that Nicholas spoke about. Out, um, though I really loved how he spoke about my poems and was very taken by his insight. Um, but so because I was walk, we were walking in the burn today, so I have to read this poem in particular, Dry Stone Wall. I'll skim the scraw, dig a trench wide and deep to hold the given stone lay silver grey against green, rocks with square planes to build off, slivers thin as slate to level in between. I lift the stones, test where they'll nestle into what's already there, fill the middle with spalls, keep the edge stones from falling in. I use old stones, dappled with lichen and moss, leave gaps to let the wind blow through, nooks for pennyworth and hearth's tongue to grow. 
I'll cover the joins, mine the batter, stack each course till it takes its place between two fields. Keep a few of the finest for the finish, long and flat capstones to span the width. It'll be the kind of wall cattle will stand by, stretching their necks for a scratch on a high stone. So it, oh, it's lovely to read that <laughs> in the burn of all places when, you know, today I was in awe at those stone walls. Um, so then the, the second poem I wanted to read is also from the river, my, fir my first collection. And it was, why I chose this was because of the conversation last night about pastoralism. And one of the things that the two speakers were talking about, it, it, Anne and Fiona, this is the Burn Bio conversation last night. They were talking about land security and land ownership. So I felt that this poem inspired by farm labor in Ireland uh, is relevant for what they were talking about. Who owns the field? Is it the one who is named in the deeds, whose hands never touched the clay? Or is it the one who gathers the sheaves, takes a side to the thistles, plants the beech, digs out the dockweed, lays the live hazel? Is it the one who is named in the deeds, or the one who pulls ragwort on his knees, lifts rock into a cart, splits larch for stakes, the one who gathers the sheaves, slashooks the briars, scatters the seed, cuts his hand on barbed wire, hangs the gate? Is it the one who is named in the deeds or the one who could surely lead to where children made a hiding place in an old lime tree? He gathers the sheaves. Is it the one who tends cattle and sheep and can tell you how the field got its name? Is it the one who is named in the deeds or the one who gathers the sheaves. And obviously, uh, Nicholas talked about sheaves, gathering sheaves at the beginning of his talk, and also laying the live hazel. Again, if you're in the burn, I mean, I was just amazed by the hazel everywhere today. So that seemed a good one to, to mention. And so then just the last poem I'll read, it's actually a recent one from this summer. And it was commissioned for a, a, the a festival in a van, which some people may have come across. But I wanted to read it because of women in the farm and uh, women's lives. And uh, Nicholas read my Rhode Island Red uh, poem. But obviously, I keep going back to hens in the farm. So this one is inspired by my grandmother, eggs. I'd have followed her anywhere but my grandmother rarely went farther than the yard tending her hens. Every morning she poured fresh water and ladled corn into the dented tin dish, adding handfuls of seeds and grit. From a gap in the galvanized roof, sun lit up the lines on her face. She let me reach into nest boxes to grasp warm eggs, then slip them into her cardigan pockets. She chased the cantankerous cockerel away and warned, watch out for men who fancy themselves. At the kitchen table, she, we divvied up the eggs, rolled the surplus in melted lard and salt, and stowed them in the scullery like pullets roosting on a high shelf. So there we are. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, Jane, thanks so much. Um, if anybody wants to post a question, please do. But Jane, you said you wanted you had a few questions or a few comments you'd like to make to uh, Nicholas. Yeah, well, um, Nicholas, one of the things I was thinking about, I know that you've written many books 
uh, about literature before, you know, you know, Shakespeare and Singh and Yeats and um, Tom Murphy, uh, uh, to name but a few. But I was wondering, it seems as if this book had a special place in your heart. And I just wanted to ask you a bit about that. And, you know, was it in a way a labor of love, you know, and uh, just a bit about maybe what you found out about yourself in some ways through this work, as well as what you realized about the farm in Irish literature. Just, I mean, and both of those are big questions, I know, yeah, yeah. Nicholas. Um, no, I mean, it certainly was a labor of love. Uh, um, uh, it was my wife who suggested the topic insofar as I, I wanted to write something about McGahern. Um, I was fascinated by the way in which he re renders the kind of rhythms of work uh, in, 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 in his fiction. And she said to me, well, you, why don't you do something bigger about the subject? And I thought, well, I never thought of that. Um, and uh, I, I did, I mean, I did feel a, a kind of connection with so much of this work because particularly for older writers um, uh, uh, and even for younger writers like you, Jane, um, there is a connection to, um, to this kind of intimacy with the farm and the farmyard. Um, and, you know, it, it, when stuff comes up about thrashing and so on and so on, um, you know, th there would be a lot of readers perhaps who just had never had any experience, that, no idea what it's about, you know. And I did feel when writing, you know, that sort of sense of recognition all the time. Uh, so, you know, when you read that beautiful poem about, about the eggs, you know, I remember so well that, you know, that feeling of putting the, the hand under the, under the hen and feeling the warmth of the egg and so on, you know. So I, I suppose it wasn't so much that I felt I knew new things, I learned new things about myself, but I felt connected to the literature in a way that I suppose I hadn't ever with, even with Singh, uh, you know, um, uh, because they were writing about my life, essentially. That answers the question. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a lovely answer. Um, and I think that recognition is just so important. And it, it's something about I think you've conveyed something about the love and the conflict. And I suppose wherever we love something very much, there is going to be conflict as well. And I think that came across in a lot of what you were talking about. I mean, just the other thing I thought, and I mean, this is very relevant to burn BO people, and maybe there'll be questions about that, about you know you, the way you divided your talk to three themes I thought were really good. And that last theme seemed in some way that the way you, 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 you came to a very sad point. Mm -hmm. Um, and I suppose it, uh, what I was thinking about is the what is the hope for us to continue to write about farming sure. if people are more disconnected or yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. yes I mean I I, I I I really don't know I don't have a good answer to that question but what I was very conscious of because of what I was writing about is that. The, the sort of ecological dimension, the sort of green factor uh, within, uh, within farming literature, I found very little of it, funnily enough, in, in, in the writing I was, I, was, I was studying. And I, I think it's something that's really only starting, you know, has been starting maybe in the last 15, 20 years. And I, I do think you see it very strongly, say, in John Connell's book, you know, uh, that sense that um, we had a connectedness to to the land, and that in the kind of wholesale modernization, industrialization, which hasn't really come to Ireland in full force yet, I think, you know, the the the, the herds of cows in in you know in England or Holland that never see the light of day, uh, much less are allowed out to graze, you know three milkings a day, cows, you know, finished when they're in their third lactation or something. I mean, that, you know, I, I think that there, there may well be uh, developing uh, within Ireland, and I can only just, I don't really know about this, uh, that there may well be a, a new turn towards 
a, an ecological awareness of, of farming and that that will produce a different kind of writing which isn't so retrospective. Mm, mm, that's yeah that's really interesting I, I mean I don't want to take up all the time here Brendan and Pranjali just in case there's anybody else who wants to ask some questions thanks Jane that was that was beautiful I mean you both are so articulate we could listen to you all night really and I'm so glad that the time has been taken up by by you both uh, more than me uh, or Brendan but uh, indeed we have a couple of minutes so if there's anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question please um please raise your hand or send send it in the Q&A button there's one there already from Connor Cleary thanks to Nicholas and Jane question for Nicholas does the famine haunt much of Irish writing on farms um, yes, it does. Um, simple, simple answer. Um, very, uh, very much there in in uh, Anne Enright's novel, *The Green Road*, uh, which I mentioned. Um, it, it it's a kind of version of 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 King Lear, though you wouldn't necessarily know it. Uh, but but the central character, the mother, um, goes out on the green road up in the Burren, and. Um, it's her equivalent of going mad on the heath in the King Lear uh, scene, but she's found uh, uh, she's found sheltering in a ruined famine cottage, uh, and I think there's that very strong sense uh, in the novel, which is so much about modern Ireland actually, from you know 1980 to 2005, but there is that strong sense of the underlying history underpinning. Uh, the, the 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 history of now, which goes back to the famine, uh, and this is obviously very one's very aware of it. Reading uh, Patrick Kavanagh's uh, great long poem, uh, "The Great Hunger," even though he's not talking about the famine as such, but he's he's using that metaphor of the great hunger uh, as a way of uh, indicting uh, the repressive society of the, of the 1940s very well aware that he's coming up to the to to the anniversary of the famine so I, I think unquestionably the famine does haunt a great deal of Irish writing on farms I was going to come in there Prangley as well before we, and I know we're running out of time but um like I'd just like to thank you both for, for an hour of pure joy anyway from where I'm sitting I just thought it was absolutely brilliant um Lucas I particularly liked the, the pictures from your childhood uh, and one about the pulping machine um and speaking of intimacy I had a very intimate encounter with a pulping machine and my thumb still bears the scar of it all these years, years later but anyhow um I think my brother Michael who <laughs> who is the other party in the accident is on the call tonight but I just wanted to leave you with a quote from um, I mentioned before um, from here in the Burren, um, our, our, our uh, uh, father John uh, O'Donoghue, as he's called, uh, uh, a great man, a great poet, but he, he had a wonderful line, John, from back in 2000, and I just wanted to read it back because I think it's very opportune tonight, but he said that there is a world in the land, a farming world of the most sophisticated complexity and the most astute and rich memory that in the next 10 years will have vanished completely. Isn't there something wrong with either our way of life or style of education that these huge ventricles of life, of memory, or of perception are not being passed on? So I guess tonight um, you gave us evidence of how they're being passed on so beautifully in some of the literature, and, and the hope is that we continue into the future. But for me, anyhow, Nicholas, and also Jane, of course, thank you so much. That was fabulous. And uh, handing back to Prangley then with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much again. If uh... You have a second chance of listening to Jane if you're anywhere near Kinvara tomorrow. Uh, she's joining us for a special poetry reading along with uh, a musician, local musician, John Faulkner. So if you're around in Kinvara tomorrow between um, six and seven, um, please book yourself in for this fantastic exclusive poetry reading event with Jane Clark. Um, and you can go to burrenwintridge.com for that. Uh, and just to remind our listeners, thank you for tuning in all the way from US, uh, many places in US and different parts of uh, Ireland and UK. Uh, the books, if you're looking for them, um, uh, Farming in Modern Irish Literature, Oxford University Press, that's Nicholas's book, and The River and When the Tree Falls, Blood Axe books um, from your local shops. I presume uh, they're available widely, uh, Jane and Nicholas. I yes. would like to bet on mine, especially. <laughs> <laughs> but 
yeah, get your hands on them. And thank you so much for joining joining us this evening. Really yeah. thoroughly enjoyed. It's a nice line, apparently, yeah. to finish Have a good with. evening, everyone. There's a nice line to finish with. Um, sure, sure, go on. A blessing from an anonymous attendee, but may the romance, in inverted commas, of the past be a hesitating, infrequent capture in the frightening years to come. <laughs> Question mark. Oh, super. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, on that note, thanks, guys, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye.